Okay, next up we're gonna roll the dice and land on infancy. Infancy is an area in human development that a lot of developmental psychologists devote their entire career for because there's so much cool stuff happening in infancy. We're gonna broadly define infancy as somewhere between roughly zero to three years of age. Could be infancy and toddlerhood, if you will. Uh, and we can see here there's five cards to play in this game. We can see five of the seven theories popping up as being monumental in infancy. One of the very first we're going to talk about again is the physical growth. We spend a lot of time paying attention to the physical growth of infants. And that's because, well, we have our neurons, but now this is the stage where the neurons become more connected than ever. This is the idea that when we're born, our eyes are pretty developed and we have our neurons, but we see in detail. We can't see resolution wise uh, the details on a person's face when we're first born. And that's because the neurons are not yet communicating with each other. The neurons have to learn to communicate and send signals to each other through what we call synaptogenesis. And that brain maturation allows us to process information and think about things in a much more mature way. We're also constantly looking at other types of growth to help us understand how the brain growth is going. So we know that babies born at Canadian public hospitals have an average birth weight of 7.5 pounds, give or take a pound and a quarter. So that lets us know that 70% of babies born in Canadian hospitals are somewhere between six and a quarter and eight and three quarters when they're born. That can tell us if the baby has a low or high birth weight. We also look at their birth proportions and see how much of their height their head takes up versus their legs. We also look at their sleep and rest patterns because sleep is when a lot of growth happens. And one of the ways we can test an infant's neurological system is through testing their newborn reflexes. Newborns have some amazing reflexes. One of my favorite is the Babinski reflex. The Babinski reflex is if you were to take a newborn and you were to put a finger on their foot and just kind of move it upwards, just lightly, you're not trying to tickle them. What will actually happen is an involuntary reflex. They're not actually trying to do this, but as you do it, their fingers will, their, their toes rather, will spread out. Another one you might be familiar with is the moral reflex. The moral reflex is also known as the startle reflex. This comes in to play when they feel a sense of gravity or they feel themselves dropping. And so this is the idea that if a baby is being placed down in a crib or a bassinet or a change table and they feel that drop, the reflex is completely involuntary, is they will, um, their arms will go out, their head will go back, and they will arch their back a bit. And they will often cry too. It's, they're startled. And so this is really painful if you get a baby asleep and you're trying to just put them down for sleep. And if you do it too fast, it'll startle them awake. Then there is the Palmer reflex. This is the idea that if you were to take your index finger and place it in the palm of an infant's hand, they will involuntarily grasp that finger. It's something you may actually find yourself involuntarily doing when you're around a baby. We just tend to put our fingers in the baby's hand and I don't know, as an adult, as a parent, I tend to get a lot of enjoyment when that baby grasps the hand. It's completely involuntary. They don't even know they're doing it. They don't have control over it. Then there is the rooting reflex. And this is the idea that if something touches the infant's cheeks, they will turn their head to the side that was touched. So if you touch an infant's right cheek, they'll turn their head to the right or to the left, they'll turn their head to the left. This is very adaptive and it helps with the feeding process. And speaking of the feeding process, sucking is also a reflex. So sucking from a nipple, whether it's on a bottle or on a breast, this is a very complicated movement. You have to create this vacuum seal with the lips. And then there's also this uh, pressure in the back of the mouth. The tongue has to move in a very complicated way. Older kids that might be picking up a baby bottle and trying to learn how to suck on it, they can't. Once they've learned how to sip from a cup, that sucking motion is really difficult. And so this is a very adaptive reflex that allows us to feed. In addition to these involuntary reflexes, developmental psychologists are very fascinated by the voluntary motor development. So by motor development, we're really talking about the development of the major muscle groups. Now, you don't need to know these voluntary motor development milestones in detail, but just for your own interest, I put some on as a guideline. And what I want you to really look for is that pattern of cephalocaudal development from head to toe. One of the very first major milestones we see in infants is that they're able to raise their head. They might only raise it a little bit. You might be cuddling them and they raise their head a little bit off your shoulder, for instance, or they might be able to raise it up a little bit more and get their chin right off the ground during belly time. That often happens about one month of age. The next milestone is to lift the chest. Now the infant I have for this image is definitely older than two months, but, but they're in the posture that I wanted to demonstrate. 
So you can see it's going subtle color from head to chest. They're getting more mastery and more strength in the muscles from the neck to the chest. Then we move to the arms. Although newborns can certainly swing their arms, around three months of age, it becomes more intentional and more coordinated. And now if they're playing with a little infant gym, they can actually reach for those objects and actually be able to swing at them with intention. As we keep going, by four months of age, now infants can sit up with support. If you've ever laid a newborn or two month old against the back of a couch to take a family photo, you might notice they just kind of slump right over. But at four months, as long as there's something behind them like the back of the couch or someone's knee or even an infant support chair that's designed for that use, they can actually sit up pretty good. By five months of age, their hands have become much more coordinated and now they can actually grasp things better with intention. Though they could always do the palmer grasp on glasses or hair or earrings, uh, now they're actually having a little bit more intention with it. And at six months of age, now they can actually sit up with no support. One of the big reasons for this is more strong muscles in their tummy and their back, but also bone growth in their legs. Their legs have to be a certain length to have them able to balance on their bum and on their legs. And when they're first born, their legs are so short, it's just not possible. As we get older, there's a little bit more variance here. And if a kid is going to crawl by about seven to nine months of age, this is when we're gonna see the crawling take place. Not all babies crawl, some of them roll or scoot or creep. Uh, and so crawling on the hands and knees tends to be initiated around seven to nine months old. So they're able to balance on their hands and knees and, and coordinate their limbs in a fashion like that. By around eight to 11 months, this is actually now, if you were to take some weight off the infant and support them and hold them with their hands, they might be actually able to stand, maybe take a couple steps, but not too many um, and, and stand up a little bit. They can't do that at younger ages, they'll just drop because they don't have the muscle strength in their legs. And finally, on average, around 12, 12 months of age is when they will tend to walk and take their very first steps on their own. So this is important. This is something that we pay attention to as psychologists. It lets us know how the nervous system is maturing. It lets us know how their growth is going. And we expect most babies to follow this pattern. If a baby didn't follow this pattern, it may signify they're going to have an atypical development trajectory altogether. And it might be a red flag for some other comorbidities. After the first year, there's a lot more variance involved and things can happen at much different time rates. But some of the things that we look for after age two is the ability to learn how to hop. It's really cute when babies, um, it's really cute when toddlers understand that hopping, you bend your knees and you lift up, but they can't actually make their feet leave the ground. If you've ever seen a young toddler who's just at the brink of learning to hop and they're, they're, they think they're bouncing, but they're not actually leaving the ground, it's really adorable. Then we have stairs. They might start off crawling up the stairs, scooting down on their bum, but eventually they'll be able to walk on stairs. And then there's running and walking backwards. And walking backwards is something that lots of toddlers like to try and do or even show off doing when they're two or three years of age. One of the things I want you to think about as we play this game is where was your motor development? Were you on time? Were you a little bit above average and develop a little bit quicker or a little bit below average? Myself, I developed a lot later. I didn't even learn to walk till I was three years of age and I'm still not good at hopping. And so there's lots of individual differences in this.